In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. All right, all right, all right. You guys ready? Yeah, all right. If you got your Bibles, bust bu- 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 them out. We're going to Genesis chapter 2. We'll be in one verse today, verse 15. Okay. Now, last week, we looked at how God created Adam. And we saw our God come down and get his hands dirty, which is a big deal, right? Because in ancient religions, the gods don't work. So, okay. God creates for six days. Whenever he creates something, he always does it the same way. He speaks it into being. But the way that he creates Adam is different. He doesn't speak him into being. No, he actually comes down and he begins working in the dirt. He begins molding um, this Adam, man of dust, okay? And then it says that he breathed up his nose the breath of life, okay? So here we have um, God's breath, okay? The breath of God. This is some supernatural stuff. I, it's the God stuff coming out of God's mouth, It's heavenly, it's glorious, it's amazing. And what's it doing? It's interacting with earthly elements. And we have this celestial, terrestrial, heavenly, earthly, hybrid creature known as man. It's pretty awesome, okay? What we're going to look at today is what happens next. What we're looking, going to look at today is his job description. Okay. How many of you, you've, ever, you, you've, you've, you've had one of them jobs where you show up, right? You're working um, and you're doing a lot of stuff. And you're doing a lot of stuff. In fact, you're doing so much stuff. And, and if, you, if you work at a church, you definitely know what I'm talking about right now. So much so that you're wondering, man, I wonder what my job description even says. Like, I, like, you know, <laughs> you're on your way to the dump with a whole bunch of stuff in the back of your truck, and you're like, is this all my job description? Right? <laughs> you know, this is interesting because to a great degree, the Church of Jesus Christ today in 20, what year is it? 2022, okay, is doing a lot of stuff. And I'm just wondering if we're in a time in history where the Lord is like, hey, church, it's time to get back to your job description. Because so many times we can preoccupy ourselves with so many religious things that we've forgotten what we're doing, why we're doing it, and who it's unto. So guys, today what we're actually going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at Adam's job description. The description of mankind. Like what is it that we're supposed to be doing here? Okay. Genesis 2 verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden, okay, in Eden to work it. Everyone say work it. Okay. It's the first thing we're going to be talking about. And the second thing is to take care of it. Everyone say take care of it. All right. Was Eden a garden? Okay. Was Eden a garden? Now, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to deal with that most of us have never been taught about Eden. So for most of us, okay, our understanding of the dynamics of Eden comes from Sunday school. Most of us, we've, we've done the entirety of our Christian lives going to church and never heard 
a week on just Eden, let alone three. <laughs> All right. Which is why, hey, if you're with us, if you're new here, uh, we've been in the book of Genesis, going through it chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We've been in it four months, okay? And we're only in chapter two. Which means that by the time we're done with the book of Genesis, I'm going to be retiring and Peter's going to be taking over the church. Okay? And, and, and the reason why that's exciting to me is that I don't have to be creative as far as what I'm going to preach on from week to week. Okay? Um, this, is, this is the series that's going to go for 80, 100 weeks. Good. Um, all right. No. Okay? We learned in chapter 1 that God created Eden... In Eden, Moses would say that he planted a garden. Okay? So Eden was this celestial, terrestrial environment. Eden was a hybrid, the mixing together a place, a, a locale, where you have heaven and earth intersecting, intermingling to the place where you probably couldn't tell what was earthly, okay, and what was heavenly. That would bug religious people. Why? Religious people are always trying to be like, that's earthly, that's heavenly. They're always trying to put categories on everything. Okay? But I tell you, there's going to come a time when there's the, the restoration of this thing. And it, 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 in the future, this place where we are going, the restoration of all things, we are going to see this place where you cannot discern the difference between what's earthly and what's heavenly. And this is the prototype for mankind, a hybrid person, spiritual and natural and not being able to tell where one ends and the other begins. And the same is true of this location named Eden. Now, was Eden created for man or was it created for God? Most of us have been taught Eden was a garden, okay? A lot of pretty vegetables, okay? You know, a good tree, a bad tree with a snake, add apples in it, okay? Like, you know, you shall not eat the apple. We just got all this crazy stuff, again, that we learned from, from Sunday school, okay? Um, now, when we think of the garden, um, we, we've been learning that Eden was not ultimately created for man. It was created for God. So... On the first day of creation, what did God do? He created a realm. It's the realm of time. He said, let there be light. There was light. There was darkness. The light he called day. The darkness he called. Very good. All right. What did he do there? He created a realm, the realm of time. On day two, he came in. And he began to separate. He created the rakia. This is the firmament. This place of space. On day one, he created a realm of time, a place where he can manifest himself amongst his creation, to, a place to abide with his sons and his daughters. Day one, he creates the realm of time unto himself. On day two, he creates space. Space, okay, and on day three, he continues to separate, bringing separation to the of the chaos waters, bringing about cosmos out of chaos. Cosmos means divine order. Okay, absolutely fascinating. On day four, five, and six, what does he do? He begins to fill these realms with creation. Okay, now we see that on day seven, what does God do? Um, everyone says that God took a nap. That's not what God did. God was not tired. We've got, the problem is, okay, is that a lot of us have been taught that Christianity uh, is an American religion. And some of you are like, yeah. Okay, no, no, no. That's Mormonism. No, literally, they, they teach in Mormonism that Eden was located in Jackson County, Missouri. It wasn't. It was in the Middle East. Okay? Okay. All right. So, <laughs> so I'm glad we're all on the same page here. Like, like America always loves to put America right in the center of everything. Okay? It's not even mentioned in the Bible. Deal with it. All right? <laughs> Which is a little scary when you think about our eschatology. We are the center of the world. No, we're not. No, you aren't, you little millennial. <laughs> okay? Like, good time. <laughs> all right. So on day seven, what did God do? 
if he didn't take a nap. On day seven, he's Sabbath. We see this principle of Shabbat, which means what? It means to return to the seat. On day seven, what did God do? He came into his temple and he sat down on his throne. Okay? Eden was a temple. What did temples have? Gardens. We see that Eden is a temple unto the Lord, and Eden has a garden. Now, the problem with garden, okay, is that when you hear garden, you think of a vegetable garden, a vegetable garden, right? You, you think of, you know, dirt. You think of jalapenos, avocados, and wine grapes, because what else would you grow in a garden? Amen? Just me? Okay. Uh, this isn't a vegetable garden. Eden was a holy place. All right, so we see, and this is all part of our study together, when Moses describes Eden, he describes fragrances. Fragrances that would also be used in the description of the temple with the incense that would come forth. Moses declares precious stones, precious, some of the same precious stones that would be used in Aaron's ephod. We see um, also in Revelation 21, which I'll allude to, we're actually going to do a deeper dive of Revelation 21. What's Revelation 21? It's what I call Eden 2.0 that comes from where? Out of the sky, returns to the earth. This is the new Jerusalem that comes down. And what does it look like? It looks like Eden, you guys. No, it really does. Read the, read the description of the new Jerusalem coming down. God is on the mountain. It comes and settles down the earth. What are you going to read about? You're going to read about stones. You're gonna, the, the same stones described in Aaron's ephod. The same stones that are described in Eden. Okay? So you get to Revelation 21. Here comes the mountain of God. You see the temple come down. Eden 2.0. Okay? This, it comes down. Now, why is this important? Because, again, we think of garden as, okay, so the very first job description was, was that Adam was a gardener. I've taught that. There's, there's kind of a, a beautiful metaphor in gardening that's, that we will talk a little bit about today. But the problem is, is that when we see God say that you are to work the garden and keep it, and if we're going to try to contextualize that for us, then we would end this service. Y'all would go down to Home Depot and buy yourself some rakes and some hoes and, right, and go to work on your little patch of dirt. And what we do is we try to make that a metaphor for our, and this is what I have done. So what we're going to study today, you guys, what we're going to dive into today is we're going to deconstruct the traditional way that it has been taught to keep it, okay, and to work the land. Because in the Hebrew, it's ra it reads radically different, which means that it could have a radically different outcome than what we've been traditionally taught. All right. <sighs> so what was Adam supposed to do in the garden? Let's look at it. The Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden, okay, to work it and to take care of it. The first word we're going to look at, and Patty, you, you have permission to correct me. You weren't in the first service, so I just owned these words, okay? But the first word is the word, this work, abad. Everyone say abad. Abad. Okay, awesome. Work. You're also going to keep it, okay? And um, uh, we'll, we'll look at that, that word here in a second. Now, when it comes, Adam, you're going to work it, and you're going to keep it. This is interesting. Both of these verbs are feminine verbs used in the context with a garden that has masculine identity according to the Hebrew. This is according to the pronominal suffix connected to each verb as said by scholars, and they find this radically fascinating. Why would there be two verbs, feminine in nature, referring to a masculine garden? Now, when we look at this word, abad, Okay, work. And then we look at the second Hebrew word, which is shamar. I'm going to say shamar, okay, to keep it. These terms most often don't refer to agriculture or gardening. In fact, these verbs usually in the Bible describe human service to God. These words are most connected to religious service actually as seen in worship. 
Now, this is really important. Why? Because if you, if you read this wrong, you will think that what God is saying is, Adam, your job is to worship the dirt. Yeah, so if you think that that's what, no, that's not what it, what it says. The, the word there, to work, okay, this garden place, okay, it can be found all throughout the Old Testament, usually in the context of priestly worship and preparation. Okay, Exodus 3.12, I'll read it. And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you. That it is, that I who have sent you. And when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will, Abad, and we say, Abad, okay? When I bring you out, you know, this will be proof, you will, Abad, that is what? You will worship God on this mountain. It's the same word. Adam, you were to Abad, okay? And this is what God says. This is proof that I'll be with you. I'm going to bring you up the mountain, and you're going to Abad, okay, this word of Worship. It's the kind of work executed by priest for the glory of God. <laughs> All right. Numbers chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. What does it say, Darren? I'll tell you. Calm down. Here's what it says. They are to perform the duties for him, for the whole community, at the tent of meeting, by doing the abad of the tabernacle. They are to take care of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, fulfilling the obligations of the Israelites by doing the work of the tabernacle. Give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are the Israelites who are to be given wholly to him. Appoint Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. Everyone say priest. Okay? Anyone else who approaches the sanctuary is to be put to death. In these two different cases, we see that the purpose of the verb here refers to what is being worshipped or worked. It's not the ground. These are tasks given to priests for the worship of Yahweh Elohim. Okay? This is the origin of mankind's original job description. Do you think that our original job description is to be agricultural stewards in a garden? Okay? That's what traditionally is taught from this text. Or, option B... Do you believe that our original job description is to be priest serving in a holy temple? This is the question that scholars ask when they are breaking down the meaning of these words. What happens in a garden? Things grow. Unless it's my garden. What happens in a temple? A temple is the place where God dwells. Is this a garden or is this a temple? Everyone say shamar. This is the second verb, to keep it. It's used in the context of, yep, you guessed it, Levitical priestly responsibilities. All right, what does this word mean? It means... To guard a sacred space, a space observed for religious commands and responsibilities. It would say guard. Okay. This verb is only used about agriculture when it refers to the guarding of crops from people or animals who want to destroy it. Okay. The verb applies to Levitical activities. Anytime you see this word, it's going to show up with what? Priests. <laughs> it involves, are you ready for this? The control of access, gatekeepers, guards, those who protect the holy area. But it is often, okay, more generally used to, prov to describe the performing duties of priest on holy ground. Number one, there are numerous biblical examples in which shamar and abad are used for Levitical service. Number two, the context of shamar in this verse 
favors sacred service and not just mere agricultural work. Number three, since Abad is as likely to refer to sacred service as it is to agricultural tasks. Number four, since there are numerous indications that the garden is being portrayed as a sacred space, it is likely that the job description given to Adam is of priestly nature. That is, caring and guarding this sacred ground. God's original plan for humanity is not that we would be a corporation of gardeners. Phew, that's, that's nice. No, God's original plan for humanity is that we would be a company of priests. Okay, good. Well, that's different, okay? So then... Let's go a little deeper. What's the duty of a priest? In ancient thinking, priests would give care for a sacred space. And in doing so, this is their way of upholding creation. The idea was this. When we serve as priests in a temple, we are preserving order and chaos is being held at bay because of our religious responsibilities. Who thought this? Well, the Egyptians thought this, and so did the Israelites. In the ancient world, there was a universal belief that what had been achieved in the better sheet in the beginning must be maintained. Humanity's essential task was to maintain the fabric of the cosmos. That caring for such holy ground should be seen much, much, much more than landscaping. And much, much, much more than even what you read about in the Bible describing priestly duties. Maintaining and guarding Eden is and was an invitation from God to collaborate with God in the ongoing task of sustaining this God-established cosmic equilibrium. That in the people of God, being the people of God, being priests who are functioning according to their divine blueprint, and doing so, we don't just change people's lives, but we keep a sense of cosmic balance, this place where we're not just stewarding soil or individuals, but we are literally stewarding, sustaining, and expanding heavenly shalom on the earth and in the heavens. Celestial, terrestrial, hybrid brings, you don't know where one is earthly, where earth and heaven meet or end. This was God's original blueprint that gravity would not keep us bound here, but that we could ascend and descend and function according to his original blueprint. When we forget where we came from, then we're going to forget where we're going. We got to go back to get to the future. You got to get back to the job description. No, you don't just read your Bible, go to church once a week, go to connect group, try to be moral, try to do the right thing, try to stop swearing as much. What does a Christian do? Tell me what a Christian does so I can try to meet those obstacles. Give me my duties. Give me my task. Guys, you want that to be your Christianity? It's going to be the most painful thing you've ever done. What do you need? Pool rules? Can I tell you what I hate about the swimming pool? All the rules. I'm like, I'm breaking like nine out of the ten of those right now. <laughs> it's because I'm not running. God has created us in his image and likeness. Sin messed some things up, man. Sin, it messed some things up. And because of sin, we're always trying to redefine his blueprint. 
We've got to get back to the logos and the rhema. We have to get back to the God-breathed written word. And we've got to get back to the breath of life in the context of intimacy where we can hear him as priest. You're tr- so, so many people in the church are trying to find a middleman. I need, I need somebody to be my middleman. I need somebody to tell me what Jesus is saying. I need a prophet. Oh, you're, I need another prophetic conference. Oh, it's funny. We have a prophetic conference, but I'm always the one dissing my own prophetic conferences. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, I love the prophets. I believe in the prophets. But, man, the, the prophet worship, the prophet idolatry that's happened in the charismatic church is sickening. We're not going to be able to change the earth until we realize that we're not supposed to be working in the dirt. We are supposed to be priests. Exalting, connecting, and serving the Lord. And then loving, stewarding, and caring for the earth and his people. What does a priest do? priest goes up, a priest comes down. What would Jesus do? He was always disappearing. His disciples are always like, where's Jesus? Where is he? He's supposed to be here. The disciples, that's what they're always saying. Where's Jesus? What was Jesus do? Jesus would always disappear. To do what? To go up, Father, and then to come down. Go up, we receive, we come down, we give. That's what a priest does. That's the order of a priest. We receive. We give. Maintaining and guarding Eden was an invitation to collaborate with God. Everyone say collaborate with God. In the ongoing task of sustaining this God-established cosmic balance, it is he who for six days brought about cosmos out of chaos and then invites for us to partner with him as dominion stewards. This is the mandate. To Abad and to Shamar, to complete what is unfinished, to preserve the existent, not the status quo, but in a continuing, dynamic, even a revolutionary process of remodeling and improving the earth. This, in combination with the first mandate in Genesis chapter 1, that we would be fruitful and multiply, that we would take dominion and subdue the earth. This is the job description of the believer. I'll read it again for you. This is the mandate, the Abad, the Shamar, that we would complete what is unfinished, preserve the existent, not as the status quo, but in a continuing, dynamic, even revolutionary process of remodeling and improving the earth. And as good as Eden was, it was still yet vulnerable to evil, deception, and even death. And because Eden was so vulnerable, part of this Edenic mandate is the Hebrew word shamar. Everyone say shamar to keep it, right? But this word is often translated in the Old Testament as watchman. Adam's primary role as a watchman over God's creation was to guard the holy place. To be a protector, to be a keeper, to be a watchman. Eden was completely good, but it wasn't completely secure. Everybody says, what's the very first mistake that mankind made? Well, (laughs) it was actually not the man. (laughs) Very first boo-boo, if you will, okay? 
But it's the woman, okay? The woman got us into this mess, okay? God came into the garden. We're going to look at this. God came into the darkness, garden. Looking for who? Looking for Adam, okay? And what does Adam say? <laughs> well, <laughs> that woman that you gave me made me eat the fruit, okay? And what does God say? I'm not looking for her. I'm looking for you. <laughs> Whoops. Uh-oh, Adam. Okay. I know it's not that weak yet. I know that we're talking about job description, but if Eve ate the fruit, then why did God come looking for Adam? Because Adam was the watchman. Adam was the police officer. And the problem wasn't that she ate the fruit. The problem was that there was a serpent in the garden because of Adam. So let me talk to the guys for a second. You've been called of God from the very beginning. It is a part of your origin mandate that your primary job description is that you are to be a watchman that you are to be a police officer and a patrol car, and you are to know who is in your garden. That our children shouldn't be talking to snakes, that our spouse should not be talking to snakes, and if they're talking to snakes, it's not our children's fault, it's not our spouse's fault, it's Adam's fault. God came in the garden, he said, Adam, where are you? We are about to sit down and have ourselves a conversation. Here, I'm gonna tell you what the problem with men in the church is. And I was just kidding. I roll, <laughs> roll my sleeves. The problem is that we define the fruit of the Spirit as love, joy, and peace, yeah? And we do that through our fear of man filters. Because look at Jesus. There were times that he didn't look very loving. In fact, there were times that he looked like a jerk. For real. Like, there's things that Jesus told people, I would never tell you. You know what I'm saying? Jesus, man, where's that guy's love? Jesus, that's not love. What about joy? There were times when it seemed like Jesus wasn't very joyful. Jesus, bro, you need to be a little bit more lighthearted. Where's your joy? Where's your fruit of the Spirit, Jesus? Gosh. What about peace? Man, Jesus, you seem a little uptight. Jesus, are you, is there some performance? Jesus, there's some orphan stuff that we need to sit down and kind of process through? Why? Because we define love, joy, and peace as Americans. And we use the same word for God that we use for our iPhone. What does real love look like? It looks like a dude that stinking shows up. That shows up. It looks like a man that's willing to speak up. It looks like a man that's willing to fight for something. Why? What does love look like? It looks like Jesus. It doesn't look like John Lennon. That's not, John Lennon is not the picture of peace. Jesus is the man of peace. What does peace look like? It looks like a tatted up. Fierce warrior king riding a huge, crazy white stallion. Fire coming out of his eyes. And a two-edged sword coming from his mouth. That's what peace looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For all the dudes here, I don't blame you. We are a generation raised by women. We are a generation fathered by men that didn't know how to be men. And it's because of you know, World War II, it's because of a lot of issues, a lot of cultural stuff. 
But listen, as a pastor and as a priest, I break that religious passivity thing off of you. That thing where you have to be kind, where you have to be this tame, this tame down, domesticated thing. No, he built you for war. He, he built you, he built you to be a warrior king. He built you for a horse. He built you to wield a sword. He built you to protect your family. He built you to, to fight for your bride. He built you to raise up your children in the way that they should go. And if you're a man in this place, I break that passive, religious, mamsy, pamsy form of Christianity that was put on you. And I declare you are a man of truth, a man of excellence, and you have permission to be you. To be you, to be you. Man, don't allow, I, I actually am kind of thankful that Christian bookstores don't exist anymore. Man, you go into a Christian bookstore, they reek of potpourri, there's, there's you're just like, what is this? Man, <laughs> I love the fact, I'm just gonna say it. I, I love the fact that I came to the prayer event here on Friday night and a man of God, he's, his reputation is a man of prayer, okay? I some of you aren't going to like this. But he came up to me and he gave me a box of Pop-Tarts. And he said, brother, if God don't intervene, you're going to need more of these. Chris, you can play something if you want. <laughs> these were some heavy Pop-Tarts, Chris. Heavy Pop-Tarts. Some dense Pop-Tarts. Let me tell you something. These Pop-Tarts... You don't put them in a toaster. Why? Because this, this intercessor, he doesn't even go to our church. He comes here sometimes. He's an intercessor. He's leading men all, all, over, all over the place. <laughs> You're like, what's in the box? What's in the box, Pastor Darren? What did the intercessor give you? Give me a whole bag full of, full of hollow point 45 caliber shells for my new 1911 handgun that was gifted to me for my 40th birthday. Listen, I'm not telling you to go get a gun and get ammunition. Like, you, you might be a dude, that might not be your thing. But I'm telling you, you have permission to be a man, to have some man friends, to have some man conversations, and to discover what it looks like to live in Christ, to discover what it looks like just to be you, where you don't have to tame yourself, where you don't have to like try to cater to perform up to somebody's religious expectation of you. You get to have permission to have real conversations, right? I don't feel like I'm measuring up right now as a husband. I don't feel like I'm measuring up right now as a father. I don't feel like I'm very present for my children. Man, I just would like to do something kind of fun. I, I would like to just do some doodly things with some doodly guys. And, and let, me just, let me just tell you guys something that uh, I know I'm talking to the guys right now, but God God is raising up warriors in this day. And this isn't like, this isn't like a who's better man versus, no, no. This is, I'm telling you, the, the women of God are going to be so relieved when the men learn how to be men. The women aren't just going to have to sit there for three days saying, what are you thinking right now? I'm fine. No, you're not. I'm fine. I'm fine. We're not going to have to do that. Why? Because we're, we're coming up into a new thing. You guys, it's not just the men. It's the men and the women. We've been called to be watchmen, to guard the holy, the holy place, to secure down and lock things down, and to drive the serpents out of the land. I love the story of St. Patrick. We're going to be uh, celebrating St. Patrick's Day coming up. I don't know about you. I celebrate St. Patrick's Day. He was the, he was the saint. We're going to be studying St. Patrick's Patrick and, uh, and the Interrupters series coming up. He was the, the, the man that drove the serpents out of Ireland. I wish there was a generation. I think there's a generation. I think there's a church just over on the east side, just about 15 minutes out of downtown Seattle, where people gather from over 20 different cities. People drive here. Guys, we have a couple that drives two hours every Sunday to come here. We got another couple. They drive from Portland, Oregon to come here every Sunday. They had wake up at 4 a.m. to get here. Why? Not because of my preaching, although it's pretty good. 
not because of the worship, even though it's outstanding, not because of the quality caliber ministries that we're doing all the way across the fabric of this place. People are coming here because God is summoning an army of watchmen that will drive the serpents out of the Seattle region. Okay, I'm gonna end with this, and I didn't share this at the nine o'clock because you're my favorite. I tell all the services that. Um, okay, I once had a dream, and in the dream, as at the South Center Mall, there's this woman full of devils. She was going off, right? And I'm standing there watching it in the food court, okay? All these police officers came out to correct her, and they came in on their motorbikes. You guys know what she did? She picked up those motorbikes. She began throwing those motorbikes with superhuman strength. The police officers freaked out. They didn't know what to do, so what'd they do? Nothing. And she continued to terrorize um, the mall. Well, I lost it. I, I, I felt so much holy, I can't describe it, like you could call it holy anger, but it was like holy rage. I felt like the Hulk. I felt like my muscles, I can't even describe it because I've never looked like the Hulk. <laughs> Not yet. All right. I'm serious. I'm like flexing. I feel so much supernatural power. Yes, but even greater than that, I felt so much supernatural authority. And I threw open the doors and I looked at her and all I remember saying is you and I woke up from the dream you want to know what that was the Lord uses dreams to deposit in me a taste of the authority that he's inviting for me to step into what was so exciting about that dream is that I got a sample of what that kind of authority felt like. And can I tell you something? It felt awesome. You know what? Since that dream, I have been able to step into the same authority that I felt in that dream. I am now walking in that same authority. I could tell, I could tell you stories, but I won't. But there are these times when the enemy is doing what he's doing, trying to intimidate, and I feel that same spirit, I feel that same authority. You, 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 you are what? You are defeated. You, you think you get to do that? You are, de Satan, you're defeated. A police officer has what's called jurisdiction. And that means the authority to do what needs to be done to reinforce the law. We, at our prayer night on Friday night, uh, Jeff Rogers was here. He knows the new mayor in Seattle who shared with us on Friday night that he's, did, do you remember how many police officers he's hiring? 120, 150. Our previous mayor, God bless, God bless her. Yeah, right? Laid off all of these police officers. All, a bunch more police officers had to quit because of the mandate nonsense. Okay? Our new mayor is hiring 150 law enforcers in Seattle. Hey, listen now. That's prophetic. First in the natural and then in the spirit. Listen, listen, silly pants. We're not supposed to be playing in soils with rakes. We're supposed to have a gun, a badge. You're supposed to understand your jurisdiction is the earth and that God has called us for such a time as this to be stewards, to say, this earth is my garden. Satan, get out. This is my home. Satan, get out. This is my marriage. Satan, get out. This is my church. Declare me right. Listen, if you're a part of the church, you better never say, at your church to me. I will slap you, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. 
This is Jesus' church, amen? This is also your home. Declare with me right now, this is my church. It's your garden. Say this with me right now, Satan, get out. Let's stand. <laughs> yeah. Let's land the plane. Go ahead and put out your hands. Declare with me right now. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth. Jesus, you are Lord. I confess I have sinned against you. I ask you'd forgive me of all my sins, that you would break the power of sin, sickness, disease, death, and mental torment. I declare I am a son of righteousness. I am a dominion steward. The heavens belong to God. This earth belongs to me. I declare I'm a son. I belong here. I'm not an imposter, but I will keep the imposters out. I will guard in my heart. You're gonna put your hand on your garden. <laughs> I will guard my heart, for it is the well stream of life. I've been hurt in the past, but I choose to forgive that Father can use me to be an ambassador of reconciliation. I'm called, I'm ordained, I am the righteousness of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you.